Hello, everyone. After Packet here. Uh, we have a pre-recorded video for you. It's an int intro to here. Velociraptor. This is about a 40-minute presentation. We hope you enjoy. And if you have any questions, please feel free to direct them to the workshop Jack one or the Recon Discord server for more immediate answers. We hope you enjoy. ...video to uh, demonstrate how to install Velociraptor and we'll just do a quick guided tour through the Velociraptor uh, features and have a quick introduction to this new DFIR tool. I mean, you might have heard of Velociraptor before, and in this video, we will show how to install it and we'll just do a quick demonstration. So, I'm going to start off by uh, you can see my desktop. This is a, a typical Windows system, and I'm going to show you how to install it from scratch in a few minutes. And then we will, we will look at uh, how to actually use it in real DFIR work. So the first thing that I'll do is I'm just going to go to the, uh, to the GitHub page. And I'm just going to search for uh, a GitHub page for Velociraptor and download all the, uh, the releases. I'm going to show you how to install Velociraptor in the cloud on a cloud platform. So first thing I'll do is I'll download the releases. Uh, I'm going to have a server uh, which will run on Linux. So I'm going to need to download the Linux binary. I'm also going to run the Windows executable on Windows. So I'm going to need to download the Windows binary. And also, finally, I'm going to need to download the source code so I can show you guys how to build an MSI installer. Um, so once I download these binaries, I'm going to open a new shell. Um, and I'm just going to run it as administrator uh, so I can install the relevant MSIs. Uh, and I'm, uh, since I just downloaded it into the downloads directory, I'm just going to uh, change directory to that. Oops. Like downloads. Okay, and if I do a DIR, I can you can see the, the binaries that I've just downloaded. Okay, great. So the first thing that we need to do is create a configuration file uh, in which we can deploy on the server. Uh, I'm going to create the configuration file on the Windows machine, and then I'm going to push it out into the server, uh, create a Debian package, and push it to a Debian server in the cloud. So first thing I will do is I will generate a configuration file using the configuration wizard. I'm going to use the dash I flag, which is the interactive wizard, uh, which will help me con generate the configuration. So it goes off and it will ask me some questions about what exactly, what type of deployment I want to use and it will actually create configuration for that. So I'll start off, I'm going to be running it on a Debian machine. So I'll choose a Linux server. Uh, File-based data store is usually the simplest and this is the directory that I'm going to store all the files in. Uh, in this particular example, we're going to create a Let's Encrypt certificate automatically. So it will create uh, an SSL certificate without any further intervention. Uh, and we'll also authenticate with standard usernames and passwords. So this is the second option. And I'm going to use one of my uh, VM machines, uh, uh, training VMs. And this will be the domain name for the training VM. So because we want to create a DNS, uh, an SSL certificate, we're going to need DNS uh, to be properly set up. So we're going to use a real DNS name. And Velociraptor has this really useful feature where it will actually update dy dynamic DNS by itself without us doing anything uh, at all. So if we use Google domains for the Dyn DNS, then it will be able to go out and update it. And over here, I've got the credentials for that, which you can get from the um, dynamic DNS settings of the Google domains. So I'm just, I just literally copied them into the, into the prompt here. 
Um, and then it will ask me to create a new a user. This is the initial administrative user that will be created when uh, the service installs. So I'm going to just create a new user and give it a password here. And then just press enter. It will generate some keys, finish configuring it, and you can see that it created a server config and a client config. If I have a look at the files, then we have the server configuration and then the client configuration, which contain the keys, uh, the key material and all the configuration. So the next step is simply to create a server um, Debian package using that configuration. So we're gonna run the Velociraptor again and tell it to use the server configuration and Debian uh, server. So we're just asking it to create a Debian package for the server. Um, if we just try to do this now, then it will say, uh, I, I don't actually have a Linux binary. So you're running a Windows binary and you're asking me to, uh, to build a Debian package. So I need the Linux binary as well. So in this scenario, we're gonna need to give it the binary, the Linux binary to actually pa package as well. So, so we do that and it will actually build us a dev package. Let's have a look. And we can see that there is a Debian package here that contains the configuration embedded with it and all the startup scripts and it's all, all the service configuration. So all we have to really do is now just push that to our cloud endpoint and, and then start it. So I'm just going to SCP it to my cloud machine. And uh, over here, I've got my IP address of my cloud machine. And, and it will just download, uh, copy the Debian package over there. So now I will SSH to that machine and install it. Okay, and if we have a look at my home directory, there is the Debian package there. So I just install it with the package and it's going ahead and install the service and created it. So it's already pre-configured to start and it should just work, it should bring up the service. I can check the service is up, service Velociraptor. Status. And it shows me green, active, running, and it's all ready to go. So now, if I go to that with HTTPS, vm1.training.velocidex.com, then I should be able to log in with the username and password that I gave it before in the configuration file. So now we have a Velociraptor server set up. It only takes a minute. You can see down here the version, and this is the GUI. But this is great. So that's the server, but we still don't have any clients attached to it because we haven't really deployed the client side of it. So now I'm going to show you how to create an MSI for being able to deploy on the Windows platform. So let me get out of there. So we'll go back to our uh, downloads that we had here. And to build an MSI, we use a tool called Wix, which is a typical uh, MSI framework, build framework, and it's very easy to do. Let me just open the source code, which to be downloaded from, uh, from the GitHub page. And in the docs directory, you will find a directory called Wix. And this directory contains all the scripts required to build the Wix, uh, to use Wix to build the, um, the MSI. So I'm just going to paste it and just extract that one directory into, into the downloads directory. Okay, so I can see it here. And let me go into it. And I'll just quickly show you guys all the scripts here. We have a number of different scripts. Um, and what we wanna do is we wanna build in this case, a customized version of our MSI that 
already embeds our special configuration. So that MSI will be used, can be used to then uh, deploy using any number of um, software management tools like, um, like uh, group policy or SCCM or anything like that. So in order for these scripts to work, I need to create a directory Even called engines. output and copy into it the binary that I want to deploy, which would be the Windows binary output and, and call it velociraptor.exe. Okay. Additionally, I want to copy the client configuration into the output directory as well. So now, I have two files in the output directory, and these two files will be packaged. That's really all it is, that's all that's required to be packaged in the MSI. So I'm just gonna run the build custom script to create the custom MSI for me, okay? And all it does is it simply runs the Wix tool set with the right scripts and options to just build the MSI. It's gonna take a second, and it will just create an MSI that I can then use. Okay, so. Okay, now if I have a look, there is custom MSI here, ready for me to build, to deploy. So I'm just gonna install it on my machine here. And it will just install the Lost Raptor and it's ready to go. Okay, so that's all it took. And if we have a look at it over here, then we should be able to see the client already checking in. So it's installed it on this machine and checked into that Debian machine in the cloud that's running the server. So that is really all that's required to deploy Velociraptor client and server. So now I would actually just take that MSI and deploy it across the fleet and get all the, all the endpoints. So that's great. So we've actually managed to install Velociraptor in a few minutes with a proper SSL certificate, automatic Dyn DNS setup, and, and, uh, and it's ready to go. We've seen all the clients. And um, now what can we do with these clients? So let me just give you guys a quick introduction to the UI. Okay, so when you first go to the Velociraptor UI, you will see the dashboard. Over here on the left side, you can see the number of different options uh, of the different screens of the UI. The home screen is just a dashboard that tells you a little bit about the server. You can see uh, the CPU memory utilization of the server. You can see how many connected clients there are. And over here, you can see all the GUI users that are, uh, that are currently configured and what kind of roles they have. Uh, you can see that I only created one user called administrator. I can create other ones. And then over here, we can see there's a server version with the, server, the version of the server that's currently running. So that's great. Now, normally when I would uh, uh, use Velociraptor, I might want to look at a specific endpoint. So I would usually search for it. And over here, there's a search box. I can use the host name. You can see that it has some kind of uh, com completion going on here. Uh, or I can actually label machines. And you can see I can tick this machine and create a label. And let's say I call it test. The label can be anything, but it simply adds the label to that machine. So now it's called test. So now I can actually search for label test. And labels are useful later on when we when we do hunting and so on, we can select specific labels. So once we search for a machine that we want to look at in more detail, we can just click on it. And this is just an overview screen to show us uh, what this machine is all about, right? This is a Windows server data center machine. And, uh, and then we've got some basic information about it. In this screen, probably the most important thing is the, is the agent version. Um, and when it was last seen and the last IP address that we've seen coming from that machine. If we click over to the drill down page, then we can see more details about it. 
about the machine. Um, you can see more information about the platform and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but this is probably a more interesting thing that shows us the footprint of the agent on the endpoint. Uh, so we can see that it's, uh, it takes like 35, around 35 megabytes of memory and the CPU load is virtually zero because the agent's not really doing anything. So when, when we do some heavy hunting and we, we might actually do a lot more work on the machine uh, on the endpoint, then it's useful to see you know, how much memory we're actually using and how much impact we're having on the, on the endpoint. And then uh, this particular one shows us also the users that, are, uh, that exist on the, on the endpoints. But this is just kind of an overview information about it. We always collect telemetry, so you can always see the most recent telemetry from the endpoint about footprint and so on. The next tab over shows us the interactive shell. This is a, an easy UI that allows us to just create, just run shell commands on the machine. Uh, we try generally not to run too many shell commands because they can be uh, unpredictable, but it's possible to just break into a, pe uh, a shell. Over here, we've got a number of different options. We can run our shell commands through PowerShell or Command Shell or Bash. Usually, I would prefer to run with PowerShell because it's just a little bit more reliable with regards to um, escaping quotes and stuff like that. Um, so here's an example, ipconfig slash all example it will show us everything that, you know, the, about the interface. We can see that over here, this is the time and who ran the command. So when you have multiple users, you can see who actually issued this shell command. And over here we have uh, kind of a little bit of a UI here that kind of hides the results a little bit. Um, when you have many shell commands, then uh, uh, it's easy to see the, uh, it's, it's, it's a, little, a little easy to lose it. So it allows you kind of to hide them a little bit. And uh, you know, this one just kind of hides them inside of a kind of indented cell. So it's just a UI kind of feature, uh, but we can, you know, essentially, you know, um, type something else, google.com, right? And then, and then run it. And you'll see that this spinner will just wait while the command is running. Uh, and, and then when they complete, we will see the results, right? So, so we can see the, the results. So this is kind of handy when you have, have to do um, interactive, uh, interactively look at the machine. Uh, the next one over is uh, the VFS. The VFS is a way for us to interactively examine the machine, uh, the machine's file system. So over here, um, we have, these are accesses, different types of things that we can look at. Um, and what we're looking at here is really just the server's cache of, um, of, of what the file system sort of looks like. But it, it, it isn't just checking the file system on the endpoint, it's just what it already knows about. So when you navigate to a directory that hasn't been listed before, then it doesn't know about it. And it tells you, you know, data available for this directory. Right? So initially, there will be no data available. So you can click on uh, this button here to refresh the directory. And what it will do is it will just issue a directory refresh query to the endpoint and just list the directory and then refresh the server's view of it. So you can sort of like uh, go through and click and refresh, click and refresh, uh, or you can simply just, you know, do this recursive refresh and, uh, and it just goes off and, and uh, it takes a little bit longer, but it just recursively refreshes all the, um, the uh, subdirectories, so you can you know kind of look through them without having to click all the time. So this is a bit of a UI thing. Okay, and for example, if we have a look at our files, we can have, um, for instance, you you would know that there is an nt user dot that in the user's home directory, um, and we we don't actually have the data. We just know about it, so we listed the directory. And if we actually want to see that file, then we can fetch that file specifically from the endpoint. So we can just click on this thing, and it goes off and fetches it. And then we'll have a little 
icon here, which is, uh, you know, just indicates that the server has a copy of that file now. So we are able to see it from the server and we can also download it and, stick and things like that. And uh, for those of you who know, we would have seen that uh, typically the end user dot that is locked when a user is logged in, but Velociraptor will fall back to row interface parsing um, in case it's locked. So it will actually retrieve the data even, even if it's locked and you can see the hex view and so on. So that's, that's essentially um, the VFS view, which is the virtual file system. Uh, and it's just, just a view uh, over in the NDFS. Um, I think we can actually see um, what it looks like in a, MTF, in a raw NTFS parser. So we can see all those hidden files like the MFT and we can collect the MFT in exactly the same way as we did before um, from the server just by pressing this button. MFT is somewhat, somewhat larger, so it's gonna take a little bit longer. Okay, so the question is, what, uh, what are we doing when we are pressing these GUI buttons? Then we can, we can essentially just look at it in the same way and download it and so forth. Um, so you might wonder what is actually happening here with the Velociraptor um, endpoint? Well, uh, Velociraptor is really a VQL engine. It just runs these query languages. Uh, the VQL is the query language that runs the entire Velociraptor architecture. Uh, when we click on the UI, what we're doing is we're issuing uh, VQL queries on the endpoint. We're just issuing different kinds of queries. And so if we, if we go back to our overview here, then we have the collected tab and this collected tab shows us all the artifacts that we've collected. So an artifact is simply uh, a, a type, it, it's simply a VQL query, right? So every time we click through the UI, behind the scenes, the UI simply issues a different kind of artifact to collect from the endpoint. In other words, it just simply issues different kinds of VQL queries. And you can see that by simply looking at the request tab, the request tab is showing us all the, the raw request that is going out to each endpoint. And we can see over here, queries. This is the VQL queries that are going out. So really, whenever we talk to the endpoint, all we're doing is sending VQL queries to the endpoint. And that's basically uh, all, all it is. So for instance, here, when we ran the PowerShell, we would be looking at different and we can see, you know, we sent a command, that was the query and, and so on. Uh, let's have a look. So when the query, the query is um, going to the endpoint and then it will execute on the endpoint. And uh, the next tab that's interesting is the query log. So as the query is executing on the endpoint, the endpoint is logging some interesting things about the query. So like errors or, or anything like that. So we can see over here that as the query is running, we get like logs. And then finally, we it tells us how many rows the query is returning because ultimately all queries just return rows because you know it's just a query. So the results tab simply shows us the rows that are returned for each query. In, in this case, when we ran the PowerShell, it just uh, returns a row and it has a column called std out and then std error and the return code. Uh, over here, when we listed the directory, you know, it has a, a bigger query and it returns more rows and more columns, right? But ultimately, it's still the same. It's just a table. So everything we do is just a table that's returning. Um, uh, all the queries are simply, simply um, tables. So we looked at the VFS UI and it's kind of a nice UI. It's intuitive and uh, it's kind of what we used to. When we, when we look at you know, Windows Explorer or something like that, people quite understand the sort of file system hierarchy. But we see that it actually just creates artifact collections in the background, but we can actually just collect other artifacts. Um, so if we click on this plus button here, we will collect a new artifact. And over here we have a search screen, so we can search for a number of different kind of artifacts. Uh, for example, 
uh, a prefetch artifact. So as you know, prefetch is uh, a set of files that are run, uh, stored in the Windows uh, prefetch folder. Uh, and they, they maintain um, a list of information about executables that are typically run. But one of the cool things about them is that they actually create, uh, maintain a, time, a timeline of each executable when it was run. So, uh, so it's often useful uh, to build a time, timeline based on the free check, prefetch information because then we'll, we will be able to you know, uh, pinpoint when a particular binary was run, which might be useful for a DFIR investigation. So, um, so we can choose the uh, prefetch artifact and this is, and we can see that the artifact gives us a bit of an explanation about what it is that it's doing. Uh, a little bit of background information, then it, it can take a bunch of parameters. And over here, we can see this is the VQL source that's actually going to run. Uh, so we can look at it. But we don't really need to kind of understand it too much. If we want to collect this, we simply click Add. Uh, and then we will fold that top uh, pane up. So that will give us access to all the parameters that we can configure. And the, the, the parameters are actually uh, then used to control the query, the VQL query, um, or by the artifact. But you know, here we can. This particular artifact allows us to filter by timestamps, or you know, or binary regular expressions, or other things like this. Um, so, but we're just going to just run it. But usually, the defaults do kind of the right thing. So uh, when we run it it will immediately issue that collection and collect that from the endpoint, right? So it basically goes off and builds a timeline from the prefetch data. So every time we run a binary, uh, it has some, some timing here. So this is really great, right? We basically can, uh, can see what, what the results are, right? Another very interesting one is to look for scheduled tasks, scheduled tasks, because that's a, a pretty common uh, a, a pretty common persistence mechanism, and then you know all we have to do is simply click add and then just launch it, and off we go. It just it goes off and calculates it. And it take a couple of seconds and and do that, okay. and then we have the results here. So this is basically how we would collect a bunch of information, right? <clears throat> so, so far it was kind of nice. We collected specific information from the endpoint about prefetch, about task scheduler, etc. What if we wanted to collect it from all our machines at once? Uh, we have, I mean, in this case, we only have one machine connected to this deployment, but typically we might have, say, 10,000 endpoints connected to the deployment. Uh, when we want to collect the same artifact from many machines at once, we call this a hunt. And over here we have the hunt manager, which is exactly the same uh, idea, except it just automatically collects it from all the machines that are connected uh, at once. So we have a similar GUI, very similar UI to before, right? Except now if we're doing it in a hunt. So let's just say that we wanted to find all the information about running processes. So we wanted to use PS list as a hunt. So we just choose add. And again, we can configure it somehow and see that uh, we, we can uh, do a regular expression for which processes we want to look at and so on. Uh, but this time, hunt has an expiry. What this means is that once we uh, start this hunt, it will just continue running until the expiry time. And anytime a new machine comes back online and connects to our endpoint, it will pick that uh, collection up and it will just run it. So we don't have to um, catch the machine when it's on. Uh, it basically, we just schedule it and it will just run it when the machine comes online in, in its convenient, in its convenience, right? So we click next, we can specify description, uh, process listing, let's say, next. And here we can choose to run it everywhere or just choose the right labels. If you recall before, we created the label before, called test. 
we can simply restrict it to all those machines that have that label or run everywhere. And run everywhere will assign the hunt to all the machines. So we click next. Now it's showing us this is going to be the request. This is what we're going to be sending. Looks good. Let's go. When we create the hunt, it's created in a paused state. So it's not actually running yet. We click start to actually start it. And off it goes. As soon as we click start, it schedules it to all the machines that are currently connected. So far, it's only got one machine. And it's finished. So as soon as the machines will finish, it, it uh, essentially creates that. We can have a look at all the clients that are connected. There's really only one in this case, but there could be many more. The statuses, uh, status tab shows us if there's any errors. And over here, we can see the results of the hunt. Right, so over here we can see this is a process listing of this machine. Right, um, if we wanted to pros process this data uh, using another uh, tool, then we simply need to prepare a download over here and it will create a zip file that contains all of the information in this hunt from all the machines. Let's take a look what does the zip file look like. This is only going to be a small one because there's really only the one machine. But we're gonna we're gonna see a CSV and a JSON file of all of the results combined from all the machines, and as well as that, we actually have uh, the collections split up for each machine. These are the logs, and these are the artifacts that we ended up collecting as part of these hunt. So that sort of split up individually and combined. Uh, and also, if any of these hunts collect files. Then, uh, then we will be able to, to get that in the zip as well. So this is just a way that, um, that we can use to export the data. Now over here, you can see that it's still kind of in the running state. And some people are confused by that, but this is just, again, a reminder that hunts always run, they simply expire. So when we create it until the expiry time, or when we start it till the expiry time, for that time period, it will be active and then it will become stopped by itself uh, and it will no stop means that it no longer accepts new new clients that come online at that time so that's that's basically hunts um, okay so that's that's pretty cool we can see how we can export the data and use it in another tool sometimes we really want to be able to uh, post process the data within the tool within Velociraptor so the next feature I wanted to show you guys is the uh, notebook feature. And a notebook is basically like a collaborative analyst um, tool that we can use to, uh, to, to analyze the results from a particular um, investigation, put them together and post-process them. So I'm just going to show you quickly how I would build a notebook. So I would click this plus button here which creates a new notebook and I can call it whatever I want like test notebook for example give it some description um, and here I can choose collaborators that I would like to collaborate so it's like a, a collaborating you know like a Google Doc or something like that it's it's, it's very pretty um, familiar concept uh, when I submit it it will create a new notebook over here and uh, and you'll see that down here we have the, the title will be copied into here. So that over here, we can see all the notebooks that I currently have. And when I click over here, I have to actually click on, a, on the title itself to bring it into a focus. And I will see that uh, it creates, this is called a cell. So a notebook is consisting of different cells. And over here, I can, this is called a markdown cell. As you can see, it's type is markdown. So I can simply use, um, just describe this. And normally I would put like some background for the investigation, uh, demo cell for demo. Right, and I actually can also copy paste, copy image, take a screenshot. I can actually paste the image in here. 
right? And this is just Markdown. If you're familiar with the Markdown, it's very, uh, very familiar. Uh, when we save it, it simply renders it. So it's just a Markdown here where I can put some notes. So that's not the most interesting thing. But let's say that I wanted to do more uh, interesting post-processing. Well, I can create another cell and add it from a particular flow or hunt that I've created previously. So from a particular collection. So let's just uh, add cell from flow. I choose the client. And these are the, the flows that ran before, right? So here I've got my task scheduler, for instance. So all this does is it creates VQL. It pre-fills the VQL for me with the right cell IDs and all this sort of stuff. This is simply a VQL query uh, that just post processes the information that we've already collected. So it doesn't go out to the client and collect the information again. It just post processes it. It's useful in order for us to see, um, to be able to post process it and filter it and so on. So for instance, in this particular case, we're looking at task schedule and this task scheduler. And you know, maybe a, a particular um, uh, malicious task uh, would have maybe PowerShell. We wanted to know which, um, which tasks uh, are running um, PowerShell. So this one will return all the tasks and now we would like to filter it where commands and this is the regular expression operator matches power shell. Okay, and then if I press uh, save, okay, there's no power shell here. Uh, let's have a look. Okay, so we have Google update or whatever. So you can basically uh, run DLL is a common, a common uh, sometimes used maliciously, sometimes legitimately. And this machine is not actually owned, but uh, is not compromised. But um, so you can see it. So here, for example, we can filter by run DLL, see all the, all the commands that have run DLL. So this allows us to do these post-processing kind of operations. Uh, we can do the same thing, add cell from hunt. And looking at our process listing hunt, same thing. It simply creates the table for us, the query for us uh, initially, right? So for instance, we can uh, say where, where um, name matches Velociraptor to see all the Velociraptor processes that are running. You can see there it is. Uh, the Velociraptor process is running. That's the hashes, that's the authentic code information. Is it signed? Yes, it is, and so on. So we can get this kind of high level information and the username is running it as a um, system. So this is a pretty cool um, cool way of post-processing the different, different things. So, <clears throat> Um, I'm not going to get into too much into the uh, the artifacts and how to actually write VQL, but it suffices to say that uh, in this screen here, we can view all the different artifacts. And let's just uh, reiterate again what an artifact is. As I said, um, Velociraptor simply runs VQL, but if the UI simply required you to type a new query each time, that would be very tedious and error prone, and it would just not be a very good user experience. So with Velociraptor, we have a concept of artifacts. An artifact is simply a YAML file that contains uh, the descriptions behind uh, the particular uh, VQL and the VQL itself. Um, so let's have a look at uh, something like, let's say the DNS, DNS um, cache. This is an example of, a, of an artifact. And you can see that here in this screen, we can view uh, all the different artifacts and we can actually edit them as well. So this particular artifact, you can see that it has some VQL here. It just queries the DNS cache on a Windows system. So we have some uh, explanation of what it does and then it just, it just does it, right? So, um, so let's have a look at what does it look like in, we said it's a YAML file, so if we click the uh, the pencil icon here, it's going to be 
allows us to edit it a little bit. And so you can see that we can customize using this UI, we can customize the artifact. So we can simply add in here uh, the, the different, different things, right? So, you know, um, we could say, oh, okay, you know, if we, maybe we wanted to uh, add a filter or something else, we can simply um, add, we can change this as required or write our own. And so we can go over here, for instance, and uh, let's open a new tab. Collected cache. Okay, let's collect the DNS cache again. And it's very quick to do to do that. As soon as we uh, ask to collect it, it will it will essentially do it instantly. Um, it goes out to the endpoint and, and collects it instantly. And we can see all the different all the different uh, DNS uh, names that are in cache at the moment. So hopefully this was a quick short introduction um, to Velociraptor. We went through the installation process, which only took a couple of minutes. And then we uh, went through uh, some of the things that we could do with it. Uh, again, the sky is the limit, really. Um, we can collect different things and we would normally respond to the different incidents and collect, um, you know, collect different artifacts to, um, you know, all, all the time. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just a very powerful tool that allows us to gain unprecedented visibility of the endpoints um, that we really can't get with other tools currently. Okay, thanks for watching. Um, and um, yeah, if you're interested in Veloc Velociraptor, um, have, have a look, go to the GitHub and download it. It's open source um, and also contribute and join our community. Uh, thanks again for listening. Um, thanks.